chapter 6. The third major is a thick rounded muscle that forms a raised oval area on the interlateral third of the scapula when the arm is adopted against resistance. The inferior border of the third major forms the inferior border of the lateral part of the posterior wall of the axilla. The third major adopts and immediately rotates the arm. It can also help extending from the flex position. The third major is also an important stabilizer of the humeral head in the plane of cavity. That is, it steadies the head in its socket. With the third minor, the third major holds the humeral head against the pull of the vertebrae during abduction of the arm. Right. <coughs> The rotator cuff muscles, four of the scapulohumeral muscles, which are known as intrinsic muscles of the shoulder. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the teres minor, and subscapularis, right, um, are all rotator cuff muscles because they form a muscular tendinous rotator cuff around the glenohumeral joint. All except the supraspinatus are rotators of the humerus. The supraspinatus, besides being part of the rotator cuff, initiate and assist, assist the deltoid in the first 15 degrees of adduction of the arm. The tendons of the four rotator cuff muscles blend with the articular scapula of the glenohumeral joint, reinforcing it as the rotator cuff which protects the joint and gives it stability. With their tonic contractions holding the relatively large head of the humerus in the small, shallow glenoid cavity of the scapula during arm movements. The attachment nerve supply and main action of the rotator cuff muscles right, can be seen in your atlas. The supraspinatus occupies the supraspinous fossae of the scapula. A pulsa separates it from the lateral part of the fossa. See the discussion of this muscle for operative action with a description of the deltoid. The infraspinatus occupies the medial three-fourths of the spinatus fossae and is partially covered by the deltoid and trapezius. In addition to helping stabilize <coughs> the shoulder joint, the infraspinatus is a powerful lateral rotator of the humerus. Right. The teres minor is a narrow, elongate muscle that is completely hidden by the deltoid. The end is often not clearly delineated from the infraspinatus. The teres minor rotates the arm and assists in its abduction. Assists in its abduction. <coughs> The subscapularis is a thick triangular muscle that lies on the postal surface of the scapula and forms part of the posterior, posterior wall of the axilla. It crosses the anterior aspect of the scapulohumeral joint on its way to the humerus. The uh, subscapularis is the primary medial rotator of the arm and also adducts. Also joins the other rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor in holding the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity during all movements of the scapulohumeral joint helping stabilizing this joint during movements of the elbow, wrist, and hand. 
The axilla is a perimeter of the space inferior to the glenohumeral joint and superior to the axillar fascia at the junction of the arc and thorax. The shape and size of the axilla varies depending on the position of the arc. And it almost disappears when the arm is fully abducted. The axilla provides a passageway for vessels and nerves to reach the upper limb. The axilla has an apex, a base, and four walls, three of which are muscular. And our apex of axilla entrance uh, from neck to axilla lies between the first rib clavicle and superior edge of scapularis. Uh, the arteries, veins, lymphatics, and nerves pass from the neck to the axilla through the cervical axillary uh, canal, the superior opening to the axilla to reach the arm. Base of the axilla is formed by the concave uh, skin, subcutaneous tissue, and axillary deep fascia extending from the arm to the thoracic wall. The anterior wall of axilla is formed by the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor and the pectoral and clavicofemoral fascia associated with them. The posterior wall of axilla is formed chiefly by the scapula and subscapularis on its anterior surface and inferior by the teres major and latissimus dorsi. The medial wall of axilla is formed by the thoracic wall, the first to four ribs and the costal muscles and the overlaying the lattice anterior. The lateral wall of axilla is a narrow bony wall formed by the tertubular uh, groove in the humerus. The axilla contains axillary blood vessels, axillary arteries and its branches, the axillary veins and its tributaries, the lymphatic vessels and several groups of axillary nodes. The axilla also contains large, large nerves that comprises the core and branches of the brachial plexus, a network of interjoining nerves that pass from the neck to the upper limb. Proximally, the neurovascular structures are uh, in sheet, the, in a fascia sleeve, the axillary sheet. The axillary artery pins at the lateral border of the first rib as the continuation of the subclavian artery and ends at the inferior border of the teres major. It passes posterior to the pectoralis minor into the arm and becomes the brachial artery when it passes distal to the inferior border of the teres major, at which point it usually uh, has reached the humerus. For the stricter cover, the axillary is divided into three parts by the pectoralis and minor uh, and indicates its number of branches. The first one is uh, the first part of the axillary artery located between the lateral border of the first rib and the medial border of the pectoralis minor. It's enclosing the axillary sheet and has one branch, the superior thoracic artery. The second part of the axillary artery lies posterior to pectoralis minor and has two branches, the thoracoacromial and lateral thoracic arteries, which pass medial and lateral to the muscle perspective of This part of the axillary artery extends the third part of the axillary artery extends from lateral border of pectoralis minor to the inferior border of teres major. It has three branches, the subscapula, the largest branch of the axillary artery, opposite to the anterior circumflex humeral and posterior circumflex humeral arteries arise. The superior thoracic artery, highest thoracic artery, is a small vessel that arises from the first part of the axillary artery, just inferior to the subclavus. It runs inferomedially posterior to the axillary vein and supplies muscles in the in the first and second intercostal spaces and the serratus anterior. It anastomoses with the intercostal artery. The thoracoacromial artery, a short white strong, is usually the first branch of the second part of the axillary artery. Deep to the pectoralis minor, it pierces the coracoid membrane part of the clavicle uh, pectoral fascia and then divides into four branches the acromial, deltoid pectoral and clavicular. Deep to the clavicular head of the pectoral is major. The lateral thoracic artery has a variable origin. It usually arises at the second branch of the second part of the 
axillary artery and descends along the lateral border of the pectoralis minor. However, it must arise from the thoracoacromial subscapular or subscapular arteries. The lateral thoracic artery supplies the pectoral muscles, the axillary lymph nodes, and the breast. It is an important source of flow to the lateral part of the mammary glass in women. The subscapular artery, the large branch of the artery, the axillary artery, arises from its third part and descends along the lateral border of the subscapularis on the posterior axillary wall. It soon divides into the circumflex scapular and thoracodorsal arteries and supplies the subscapularis that is major, serratus anterior, and latissimus dorsimosus. Take a look in your atlas. The, uh, the location, boundaries, and content of the axilla. The, uh, take a look in your atlas, the neurovascular structures of the armpit. The anterior view, right? The posterior view, right? And also, take a look at the arteries of the proximal upper limb, right? the anterior wall of the axilla where with all the most important uh, muscles that is the pectoral major, right, with all the arteries and um, the medial pectoral nerves, right. The circumflex popular artery in the larger branch of the subscapular course of view around the axillary borders of the scapula, passing between the subscapular is the major to supply muscles on the dorsum of the scapula. It participates in the anastomosing of around the scapula. Thoracodorsal artery continues the general course of the scapular to the inferior angle of the scapula and supplies adjacent muscles, principally the latissimus dorsi. It also participates in the real anastomosis around the scapula. The simple complex humeral arteries usually arise from the third part of the axillary artery posit, the subscapular artery, and pass around the surgical neck of the humerals to anastomose with each other. The smaller anterior circumflex humeral artery passes laterally deep to the coracobrachialis and biceps brachii. It gives off an ascending branch that supplies the shoulder. The larger posterior circumflex humeral artery passes through the posterior wall of the axilla via the quadrangular space with the axillary nerve to supply a surrounding muscles. Such as the toy that is major and minor and no head of the triceps. The axillary vein lies on the medial side of the axillary artery. This large vein is formed by the union of the brachial vein, a company vein of the brachial artery, and the basilic vein at the inferior border of the teres major. The axillary vein ends at the lateral border of the first rib, uh, where it becomes the subclavian vein. Although the veins of the axillary are more abundant than the arteries and highly variable, and frequently communicate and anastomose the axillary vein receives tributaries that generally correspond to branches of the axillary artery with a few major exceptions. The vein corresponding to the branches of the thoracoacromial artery do not merge to enter by a common tributary. Uh, some enter independently into axillary vein, but others empty into the encephalic vein, where well, superior to the pectoralis minor also enters the axillary vein close to the uh, transmission to the subclavian vein. The axillary vein uh, receives directly or indirectly the thoracopigastric vein, which is formed by the anastomosis. Superficial veins from the inguinal groin region with tributaries of the axillary vein, usually the lateral thoracic vein continuing a collateral route that enables venous return in the presence of obstruction of the inferior vena cava. The axillary lymph nodes connected tissue of the axilla has many lymph nodes. The axillary lymph nodes are arranged in five principal groups, apical, pectoral, subscapular, humeral, and central. The apical group of axillary lymph nodes consists of lymph nodes of, at the apex of the axilla. 
located along the medial side of the axilla vein and the first part of the axilla artery. The apical group receives them from all other groups of um, axillary lymph nodes as well as from lymphatics accompanying the proximal cephalic vein. Efferent vessels from the apical group of nodes unite to form the subclavian lymph node trunk, which might join the jugular and bronchiomediastinal trunk on the right side to form the, the, the right lymphatic duct, or it might enter the right venous and go independently. On the left side, the subclavian trunk most commonly joins the thoracic duct. The pectoral known anterior group of axillary lymph nodes consists of three or five lymph nodes that lie along the middle wall of the axilla, around the lateral thoracic vein and the inferior border of the pectoral spinal. The pectoral group of nodes receive lymph mainly from the anterior thoracic wall, including the breast. Efferent lymphatic vessels from these nodes pass to the central and apical groups of axillary lymph nodes. The subscapular, known as posterior, group of axillary leaf nodes consists of six or seven leaf nodes that lie along the posterior axillary fold and subscapular uh, blood vessels. The group of lymph nodes receives lymph from the posterior aspect of the thoracic wall and scapular region. Efferent lymph uh, fatigue vessels pass from these nodes to the central and apical group of axillary lymph nodes. The humeral, uh, known as lateral group of axillary lymph nodes, consists of four to six lymph nodes that lie along the lateral wall of the axilla, medial and posterior to the axillary vein. And um, take a look in your atlas, the veins of the axilla and the axillary lymph nodes and the five range of the right upper limb and breast. And then uh, we were saying that uh, in, in regards of the humeral lateral group of axillary lymph nodes, right, posterior to the axillary vein, uh, we say that this group of lymph nodes receive nearly all the lymph from the upper limb except the, um, the carried by uh, lymphatic vessels accompanying the, the cephalic vein, which drains to the central and epical axillary nodes. The central group of axillary Lymph nodes consist of three or four large lymph nodes situated deep to the uh, pectoralis minor near the base of the axilla in association with the second part of the axillary artery and its name indicates the central group receives lymph from the pectoral, subscapular and humeral group of axillary lymph nodes. Efferent vessels from the central group pass to the apical group of lymph nodes. The brachial plexus, most nerves in the upper limb arise from the brachial plexus, a major nerve network supplying the upper limb which begins in the neck and extends into axilla. Almost all branches of the brachial plexus arise in the axilla. Right. So. After it has crossed the first rib, the brachial plexus is formed by the union of the ventral rami of C5 through C8 nerves and the greater part of the ventral rami, ramus of T1. The ventral rami of the last four cervicals and the first thoracic nerve from the root of the brachial plexus, they usually uh, pass through the gap between the anterior and middle stalle, which is the stalenus medius muscle with the subclavian artery. The sympathetic fibers carried by each root of the plexus are received from the gray rami of the middle and inferior cervical ganglia as they pass between the stalen muscles. In the inferior part of the neck, the root of the brachial plexus unite to form three trunks. The superior trunk from the unions of the C5 and C6 roots. The middle trunk, a continuation of the C7 roots. The inferior trunk from the union of the C8 to C1 roots. Each trunk of the brachial plexus divides into anterior and posterior division as the plexus passes posterior to the clavicle. 
without the service coaxial and uh, anterior division supply uh, anterior flexor compartments of the upper limb and posterior division supply posterior extensor compartments. The division of the brachial flexors from three cords or anterior division of the superior and middle trunks unite to form the lateral cord. And the anterior division of the inferior trunk continues as the medial cord and the posterior division of the three trunks unite to form the posterior cord. The course of the uh, brachial plexus bears the relationship to the second part of the artery that is indicated by the names, which is the lateral cord is lateral to the axillary artery, although it might appear to lie superior to the artery because it is most easily seen when the limb is abducted. The brachial plexus is divided into supraclavicular and infraclavicular parts by the clavicle. The supraclavicular branches of the brachial plexus arise from the root, which is the ventral rami, and trunk of the brachial plexus, which is the dorsal scapular nerve, long thoracic nerve, nerve to the subclavius and suprascapular nerve, and are approachable throughout the neck. The infraclavicular uh, branches of the brachial plexus arise from the course of the brachial plexus and are approachable through the axilla. The supraclavicular branches of the brachial plexus, the dorsal scapular nerve, arise chiefly from the posterior aspect of the ventral ramus of C5, with a frequent contribution uh, from C4, it pierces the middle stalent runs deep to the levator scapulae, providing a variable supply to it, and enters the deep surface of the trunk of omboids, supplying them. The long thoracic nerve arises from the posterior aspect of the ventral rami of C5, C6, and C7, and passes throughout the apex of the axilla, which is the cervicoaxillary canal, posterior to the other brachial plexus comp component to Supply the serratus anterior, the roots from C5 and C6, pierce the middle stalin, and the root from C7 passes anterior to this muscle. The nerve to the subclavius, a slender nerve, arises from the anterior aspect of the superior trunk of the brachial plexus. It receives fibers chiefly from C5, with occasional additions from C4 and C6. It descends posterior to the clavicle anterior to the brachial plexus supply the subclavius. The suprascapular nerve arises from the posterior aspect of the superior trunk of the brachial plexus, receiving fibers from C5, C6, and often C4. It supplies the supraspinatus and infraspinatus and the clenohumeral joint. To reach the muscles, the suprascapular nerve passes laterally across the posterior triangle of the neck, superior to the brachial plexus, and passes throughout the scapular notch. The articular branches to the scapula of the glenohumeral joint arise from the intramuscular parts of the muscular branches. The infraclavicular branches of the brachial plexus, the lateral cord of the brachial plexus carrying fibers primarily from C5 through C7 has three branches. One side branch, the lateral pectoral nerve, the two terminal branches, the musculocutaneous nerve, and the lateral root of the medial nerve. The lateral pectoral nerve C5, C6, and C7 pierce the clavicopectoral fascia to supply the pectoralis major. It also sends a branch to the medial pectoral nerve that supplies the pectoralis minor. The lateral pectoral nerve might actually arise from the lateral cord superior or inferior to the clavicle. However, if it arises superior to the clavicle, it accompanies the lateral cord into the axilla. Take a look in your atlas. The brachial plexus and nerves of the upper limb, the formation of the brachial plexus. Take a look the dissection of the right posterior triangle of the neck. The musculocutaneous nerves C5 through C7 exist the axilla by piercing the cora cobrachialis, supplying the muscle as it transfers it, and then passes between the biceps uh, brachii and the brachialis, supplying both. The, the, the musculocutaneous nerve supplies all the muscles in the anterior compartment of the arm. It continues as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. 
The median nerve arises by lateral and medial roots from the lateral and medial pores of the brachial plexus, respectively. The median nerve supplies primary flexor muscles and the anterior compartment of the forearm, skin or part of the hand and fine muscles of the hand. The medial core of the brachial plexus carrying fibers from C5 to C1 S5 branches. Three side branches, medial pectoral nerve, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, and medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Two terminal branches, ulnar nerve and medial root of the medial nerve. The medial pectoral nerve, C8 and T1 is a slender nerve. Uh, the passes through the pectoralis minor supplying it and then continuing to supply the pectoralis major. Although it is called the media, medial pectoral nerve because it arises from the medial core of the brachial plexus, it is located lateral to the lateral pectoral nerve. The medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, C81, is the slender nerve that supplies skin on the medial side of the arm and the superior part of the forearm. The medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, C81, is a muscular nerve that runs between the artery and veins that supply skin and the medial side of the forearm. Because it is close to the ulnar nerve inside and initially in position, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm is often mistaken from the ulnar nerve and has been dubbed the full nerve. The ulnar nerve C81 and sometimes C7 transverses the arm to the forearm without branching and it supplies one and a half muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm which is known as flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar part of flexor digital profundus and then continues into the hand where it supplies most intrinsic muscles and the skin on the medial side of the hand. The medial root of the median nerve unites with the lateral root of the median to form the median nerve, the distribution of which has been described. The position cord of the brachial plexus carrying fibers from C5 through T1 also has five branches. Three side branches, upper subscapular thoracal, dorsal and lower scapular nerves, and two terminal branches, axillary and radial nerves. The upper subscapular nerve, C5, C6, supplies the subscapular wrist. The thoracodorsal nerve, C6, C7, C8, supplies the latissimus dorsi, and the lower subscapular nerve, C6, C7, supplies the teres major, as well as the inferior part of the subscapularis. The axillary nerve, C5, C6, a terminal branch of the posterior cord supplies the teres minor as it exceeds the axilla through the quadrangular space and then supplies the teres toy from a deep to posterior aspect and continues as the superior lateral or tenuous nerve supplying the skin over the inferior half on the teres toy. The radial nerve C5 through C8 K1 the other terminal branch of the posterior cord is the largest branch of the brachial plexus. It supplies all the extensor muscles of the position department of the upper limb and skin on the posterior aspect of the arm and forearm. In the axilla, the radial nerve lies posterior to the axilla of the artery and anterior to the subscapular stage major and latissimus dorsi muscle. As it leaves the axilla, the radial nerve runs posterior inferiorly and laterally between the long and medial head of the triceps. It enters the radial group on the humerus where it is vulnerable to injury when the humerus fractures. Take a look in your atlas, the innervation of the upper limb muscles. Take a look also the anterior view of the ulnar nerve, right? the posterior view, the axillary and radial nerves, and the posterior wall of axilla, musculocutaneous posterior core and brachial plexus. Right? Uh, it is uh, very important to follow, uh, as I am reciting, right, uh, the, this, this lecture, this tutorial, to you check 
with your atlas in all these um, names of the muscles and arteries to see how they go and put uh, around and besides underneath or, or which one of the the, the uh, uh, ones we are mentioning. The arm extends from the shoulder to the elbow. Two types of movements occur when the arm and forearm at the elbow joint. The flexion, extension, and pronation, supination. The muscles performing these movements are clearly divided into anterior and posterior groups. The chief action of both groups is at the elbow joint. For some muscles also act at the glenohumeral joint. The superior part of the humerus provides attachments for tendons of the shoulder muscles. Um, let us just stop right here and let us continue with a little bit more of this chapter later.